Welcome to this course, Organizing in Times of Crisis, the Case of COVID-19. My name is Elke Schüssler and I am Professor of Business Administration and Head of the Institute of Organization Science at Johannes Kepler University Linz in Austria. You will find further information about this course on the website timesofcrisis.org. It's an open access course, so all the course materials are openly available, including the course outline. So I will not say much more about the course structure, but jump right into the topic of the first class, decision making in times of crisis. The learning aims of this class are as follows. I want to give a general introduction into the course by reflecting briefly about what the current COVID-19 pandemic has to do with organizations and management. I then want to introduce you into contemporary theories of crisis management as a process. I want you to reflect about the specific characteristics of the COVID-19 crisis as a grand societal challenge. I will then introduce you to a model of organizational decision making that has been developed for non routine, non standard situations. And on this basis, I will discuss some of the mechanisms by which crisis can lead to more systemic organizational or societal changes, or by which um, it actually fails to lead to such changes. The rest of my slides are quite full, so I will turn the camera off now. I now want to give you some examples for organizational issues that are underlying the current COVID-19 crisis. One issue, for example, is the debate about whether centralized or decentralized systems of governance and decision making are better for dealing with the crisis situation. You will find in the press, for instance, in the United States or in Germany, both arguments, right? On the one hand, federalist decentralized governance systems have initially provided very inconsistent responses to the crisis, undermining some measures such as lockdowns. But on the other hand, um, in, in the context of Germany, arguments have been put forward that the decentralized system of healthcare in particular has been an asset in tailoring the country's response to the crisis to, to local needs and for scaling up testing capacity. So this question at the heart of organization theory will be dealt with in classes three and four specifically. Another organizational issue and managerial issue concerns the supply of critical healthcare goods. Yeah? Not only the medical equipments like masks, protective gear, um, ventilators and so on, but also the supply um, of medications that are now in extreme shortage because of the global supply chains that have been created in recent years or decades. And how these supply chains can be made more resilient, more stable, more reliable is again an important managerial and organizational question. And the final example I want to give you is that the debate about masks that is being led in many Western countries is again not just a medical concern, but it is a hugely social one. It has to do with social norms, with what is acceptable and legitimate behavior. And this graphic I like very much because it's used to explain people in the West that wearing a mask is not um, to protect yourself, but to protect the community, a norm that in Asian countries is already widely established. And again, the question about social norms and expectations is one that is at the heart of organization theory. Beyond these empirical examples, I now want to briefly tell you a little bit about the relationship between crisis and organization theory. Let's start with a definition. It's actually far from trivial to define what a crisis means for organizations. Traditionally, crisis has been perceived as an unanticipated event that poses a risk uh, to life and that requires quick and decisive action. Already in the case of COVID-19, we can see that part of this definition doesn't really apply. It certainly wasn't an unexpected event because many risk reports have anticipated that such a crisis would happen. So more contemporary definitions have left out this part about unexpectedness, but rather define crisis as a rare significant event uh, that creates highly undesirable outcomes for the firm and its stakeholders. And of course, we can 
apply this definition also to society as a, as a whole. Even more radically, we can think about crisis, and here we can go back to the Greek term crisis as moments of decision, as critical turning points marked by radical openness towards the future. Situations where things could go horribly wrong or radically improve to the better, and while we're in the situation, we just do not know in which direction it will go. And from this perspective, um, crisis has been very important for organizations and organization studies as an opportunity for change. And as you might know, social systems like organizations tend to be very difficult to change, very rigid. And crisis has been studied extensively as a trigger for um, more systemic kind of changes in organizations or in society at large. Interestingly, much of our organizational knowledge is also based on studies of organizations that routinely deal with crisis events, with risk, uncertainty, sometimes extreme risk and uncertainty. One example here are um, Charles Perrow's famous studies of what he calls complex technological systems, systems like nuclear power plants, like um, air traffic, like chemical plants, where he argues that it is actually normal that accidents do happen in such systems, not because of technical failures, but because of organizational failures, because these systems are often designed in a way that makes them very complex and very interrelated. Other studies have looked at so-called high reliability organizations. So again, organizations that are designed to have reliable procedures in re re regularly occurring situations of crisis. An example here would be fire brigades um, or emergency SWAT teams or even hospitals. And this is a topic that um, will be dealt with um, in the next class in more detail. But most importantly, as a final point here, um, of course, if we go back to classic organization theory, organizations are seen as systems designed to deal with uncertainty, to buffer uncertainty stemming from the organizational environment, to reduce and absorb this uncertainty by taking decisions on issues and programming these decisions into routines, into standard operating procedures. And in doing so, organizations achieve a much higher degree of coordination, particularly when dealing with complex issues um, than any other social system does. And if we come from this um, basic understanding of organizations, of course, looking, cases, looking at cases of extreme uncertainty helps us to unpack, to unleash organizational phenomena that are of general interest, like phenomena of decision-making, of coordination, and so on. After these more basic considerations, I now want to give you a brief introduction into studies of crisis management in organizations. Traditionally, um, crisis management has been viewed rather narrowly, taking this de definition of crisis as an unexpected event that needs to be dealt with through decisive and quick action. So the focus has been on leadership during a crisis situation. So acts of sense making and framing a crisis, dealing with strong emotions, mobilizing resources, improvising, taking ad hoc decisions to mitigate the immediate effects of a crisis. This um, focus has quickly been expanded towards models that um, consider crisis management as actually starting well before the occurrence of an acute crisis situation and having repercussions after the crisis has been successfully dealt with or passed. So um, many studies, particularly so those of high reliability organizations, have focused on how organizations can actually prepare or a crisis by setting up flexible organizational structures or by establishing clear routines of what should happen in a crisis situation and so on. One example would also be considering the relationships of an organization and designing those in a way 
that the effects of a crisis can be minimized. So let's take for an example here um, the selection of suppliers. They can be selected either for reasons of efficiency and cost or they can be selected in a way um, that an organization retains some critical capacities that the su supplier relationship is flexible and can respond even in a crisis situation and so on. And crisis then um, and crisis management continues well after the crisis. After the crisis, um, a public debate needs to be led. Um, organizations need to respond to public inquiries, to questions about responsibility and accountability and so on. And ideally, organizations also learn from crisis, um, which then leads to a readjustment of structures, of procedures and so on. Now, a problem with much of this research still has been that crisis management is seen in a kind of mechanistic um, way as a progression, a rather linear progression through these different stages with a kind of idea of restoring equilibrium again after the crisis. So there's equilibrium before the crisis, then that equilibrium gets disturbed by the crisis. And the aim of crisis management then is to restore that equilibrium again as quickly as possible. Later research has come to see these stages as or phases as much more interrelated, as not necessarily progressing in a linear way, as being marked by feedback loops. And this kind of thinking, um, really focuses much more on crisis management as a continuous activity um, in a sense that, for example, what leaders have done before the crisis in the preparedness phase might actually be much more important for mitigating a crisis than what leaders do during the crisis, just as an example. And this kind of um, idea is very close to the idea of resilience that has gained prominence in, in recent debates. Resilience is defined as the process by which an actor, an individual, an organization, a social system, and another social system builds and uses its capabilities to interact with the environment in a way that positively adjusts and maintains functioning prior to, during, and following adversity. So this perspective is much more by uh, focusing on continuous acts of organizing, of paying attention to developments, of managing stakeholder relationships um, in a way that you're responsive to stakeholder needs and unexpected events and so on. So let's assume our decision makers have actually anticipated this crisis, have put uh, systems and structures in place for dealing with it. Why does it nonetheless now seem so difficult to get a grip on the COVID-19 crisis? Well, my argument here is that COVID-19 actually qualifies as a grand societal challenge, a challenge or a problem like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that transcends national borders, that has potential or actual negative effects on large number of people, numbers of people and even the planet as a whole and problems that cannot be addressed by single organizations but that require collaborative efforts. Okay. Um, what makes COVID-19 even worse is that it actually intersects with multiple grand challenges. So if you look at the sustainable development goals here, um, it intersects of course with um, the challenge of providing good healthcare systems to people around the world. It intersects with questions of decent work um, because it now becomes blatantly obvious that many critical workers are underpaid and in very precarious um, positions. It intersects with inequality because we know that um, certain parts of the population are much more se severely affected and less protected from the crisis and so on. So, my argument here is that grand societal challenges actually create particular decision um, situations that make the application of the kind of standard crisis management tools much more difficult. And the three conditions that kind of qualify what makes a grand challenge are that they're complex, they're uncertain, and as Ferraro and colleagues uh, cited here call it, they are evaluative. So what does that mean? Well, it means they have systemic causes and effects um, for multiple actors. 
dynamics um, in the ways these kind of crisis uh, crisis unfold are often non-linear. If you solve one problem, another problem occurs on another level in another country, um, in a community and so on. So they create highly dynamic um, decision-making situations. They're of course, like all crises, marked by extreme uncertainty and it is often unclear how to adequately frame the problem and how to adequately frame solutions because so many different issues intersect. Yeah, that's uh, that's the idea of evaluativeness here. Different actors have different views about what is go actually going on, what the problem is. So it becomes very difficult to identify adequate solutions. So what do we know about how organizations or other actors take decisions in crisis situations resembling grand challenges. There are several models we can draw on and you will um, learn about some of them in your readings. Here I want to use a kind of old classic um, model of organizational decision making, which has not been developed to understand decision making in crisis originally, but which has been applied by, quite widely by political scientists to understand how political agenda setting and political decision making happens. This model is called the garbage can model of decision making. And you can see from the name um, that it has been written as a rather provocative piece. The authors are Michael Cohen and Jim March, very influential organization scholars, and Johan Olsen, a political scientist. Um, that have made many important contributions to our understanding of organizational decision making in the years before this garbage can model has been developed, particularly um, by developing further no the notion of bounded rationality. Now, what they wanted to do with this garbage can model is to pay attention to decision making situations in contexts that have certain characteristics. So this is not a model that holds for all kinds of organizations and all kinds of decision-making situations. Um, the context where decision-making resembles garbage cans, they argue are contexts where preferences are problematic, where technologies are unclear, and by technologies that don't mean technical devices, but um, rules, regulations, decision-making procedures, and so on and where participation of organizational members is fluid. What happens in such situations is that organizational decisions um, result from, they argue, loosely coupled streams of problems, of solutions and decision makers, these actors that kind of come and go, that um, assemble or come together in choice opportunities that occur um, every once in a while. So the argument here really is that um, decisions don't really follow a kind of um, clear process in the sense of, oh, there's an opportunity to, to decide something, let's define the problem, and then let's look for the best um, alternative solution. Rather, what happens is that kind of solutions ideas about problems, problem definitions have been around for a long time. Different people have been carrying forward these different problems and solutions. Um, and in some moments in time, these um, come together, they converge and potentially lead to um, decisions being taken. So this is a model that pays very careful attention to the temporality and situational context in which decisions are made. One example um, that has been analyzed by political scientists um, to illustrate this kind of mechanism is the September 11 terrorist attack and the, and the policy response to it. Um, clearly, we can see that after this attack, many things have changed. Yeah, the U United States invaded in the Iraq, um, procedures for how passengers are being screened at airports have been changed and so on. And many have said 9-11 has changed everything, right? And um, Birkland, the political scientist who has written about the situation, he would argue applying the garbage can logic, well, we really have to question this notion that everything has changed because 
um, the US anti-terrorism policy has been around for a long time. The focus on Iraq has been around for a long time. Even debates about insufficient airport screenings and the need to reform these have been around for a long time. And what 9-11 has done is that it has focused on these issues, on these debates, and finally these policies that have been kind of in the drawers um, of political decision makers have then been in implemented. What has not happened, um, according to him, is that there really has been a radical change in anti-terrorist policy um, in the United States. So what the garbage can model um, really pays attention to is kind of the ways in which outcomes, decisions are often produced by small and really essentially unpredictable differences in small events that occur um, along the process. And this is why I, I put up this picture here um, rather than a garbage can that you would usually see on a slide explaining the garbage can model, um, because it's not a sort of contained um, clear procedure. It is really a rather messy process that is carried forward in nonlinear ways by small and intermediate decisions. Political scientists have been really interested in the garbage can model um, because they would argue, well, crisis events provide opportunities for coupling. They would argue that political decision-making dynamics actually resemble very much the garbage can model because different actors in political administrations have different agendas, different problems, they identify different solutions, participation is rather fluid and so on. So in a crisis event, attention gets focused on issues that have been around before, but they haven't really gained traction, neither among decision makers nor among the public. And um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez described this kind of um, mechanism very well in a video stream where she said, what the coronavirus has done, it has put gasoline on every slow rolling crisis that we have been experiencing in the US and just set it on fire for everyone all at once. Here ref she refers mainly to healthcare issues. Yeah? So the underpayment of healthcare workers, the deep inequality, of the United States healthcare system and so on. And of course, the hopes are that because these issues that have been around for a long time now are finally in the public attention, they will result in radical um, policy changes. Now, this is a rather optimistic picture, of course, in a sense that, yes, crises provide opportunities for coupling and therefore also opportunities for change. In my final slide, I want to offer some reflections here um, because we, we kind of have conflicting evidence from, from research. Now, on the one hand, organization research um, has provided many studies where crises did act as a kind of exogenous shock triggering um, changes in identities, in dominant logics, creating an openness for change that otherwise wouldn't have been there. One mechanism at work is that crisis triggers strong emotions and emotions can go in both directions. They can trigger fear, they can be fearful and lead more to a kind of reactive pattern of holding on to what uh, you know and what you've learned before, but they can also act as catalyst and create an openness, openness for change. Often, however, and I would say, especially if we move into grand challenge situations, it doesn't really work um, so easily. Yeah, and uh, again, we do have studies that show also like the example of 9-11, I have given that crisis actually often fails to lead to systemic change. And this is, of course, a very important question in the current crisis, because there are huge hopes um, not only that we will pass through this crisis and uh, that the majority of us will survive it, but it, that it will be a catalyst for creating a more sustainable and more fair economic and social system. Yeah. And here I just want to offer some final reflection on why I personally have um, um, kind of limited optimism that it will do this, um, because radical uncertainty as it is typical for a grand challenge situation actually often means that 
existing protocols are being applied. People find it very difficult to what Karl Weick has called drop their tools, um, both literally and figuratively, yeah, to unlearn what has been learned, to really be radically open for something new because decision making in crisis needs to be rapid and often um, there is no time for really strategic and long term reflection. Also, what happens is that attention quickly moves away again once the crisis is over from these issues that have gained attention during the crisis. So what, what might well happen is that now everyone is concerned about the kind of healthcare workers and other workers maintaining the system requiring better pay, for example. But after the crisis, the focus will be on recovering the economy. And this might often mean a kind of back to usual, even gaining more legitimacy because now everyone is in crisis. So we can justify this to cut, make further cuts in wages or in investments in healthcare and so on. So this is an issue that we might be facing. And the final point is that, especially in the context of grand challenges, when we're dealing with these kind of problems, people find it extremely difficult um, to pay attention to the spatial and temporal scale of the issues at hand. Yeah? Um, this means that the challenges might be, like in the case of climate change, still far in the future. But decision making often focuses on the now. Um, and particularly decision making in the crisis often focuses on the now rather than on events that are either very far away, that's the spatial scale, or very far in the future. So garbage can decision making, if you follow my argument that decision making in crisis might follow a garbage can logic, I'm not saying that it always does, um, is often very situational, it is often opportunistic, it might follow standard operating procedures, but it is not necessarily strategic and geared towards um, systemic changes. So to sum up, I wanted you to understand that crisis and organization theory are actually tightly interwoven. Um, I wanted to present uh, to you the view of crisis management as a process meaning that also the management of the COVID crisis has started long before the actual outbreak and will continue far into the future. Um, I wanted you to think about COVID-19 as a grand societal challenge, creating unstructured decision situations and intersecting with many societal problems. I wanted to present you one model of um, political and organizational decision making um, that might be applied to crisis situations, which is the garbage can model. And finally, I wanted you to reflect about the potential of crisis to be a trigger for systemic change because it focuses problems and solutions, but also um, to reflect about why often such opportunities are in fact not seized. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the course. I will um, be back again in class number 10.